were on the streets of Miami Beach asking people about sex. When is the first time that anybody ever spoke to you about sex with your parents, with your friends in middle school? I was 13. I was like 11. In middle school. Same. Same. When you're like around eight, probably like six years old. But the conversation with your parents probably doesn't happen until 12. And how did that conversation go? It went well. Okay, cool. I have no kids. <laughs> I think I spoke to myself about it. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> High school, we just talking about it. Like, what's your favorite position? Nobody wanted to bring up the club. Why? Like, I need help. Like, and since then, been slanging it. That's it. Slanging it. Sex is a taboo topic. Would you agree? How did we get here? Sex, right? Por ser Latino, es lo que pasa. No no hablamos. Sex is life. No, no, para nada. Get off your high horse and talk about sex. If you grew up in a Latinx home, odds are pretty good your family didn't talk openly about sex. And grumblings from your parents about wanting grandchildren don't count. Especially if, depending on the depths of their well-intentioned delusion, they expected those babies to be birthed via immaculate conception or magical stork. For a culture that's frequently hypersexualized or fetishized, a lot of our families have a hard time having healthy conversations about sex, assuming they're having any conversations at all. We're talking about the birds and the bees. Oh, Lord. Yeah, Lord. Yeah, I know. What was the conversation like about the birds and the bees? The you dance? never had that. You right. never had it? No way. Now look what happened. I think it was a stack of books checked out from the library. <laughs> I got you these. Hey. Knock yourself out. Yeah. I think maybe she assumed I knew. Right. She saw your hand gestures. <laughs> she was like, Stop She's her. been around. And I was like, I didn't want to have this conversation. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. I just wanted to know what the conversation was like with your parents. No? Okay. She put me on the pill. How yeah. Old were you? 14. What? We had to give him the talk the other day. I mean, look at him. He looks traumatized. I, is this Good the mom. first time you're meeting him? Yeah. Like that? No, we yeah. met. Yes, mom. I hate to tell you this, but you're too late. And she was like, okay, as long as you're being safe, you know, do, do your thing. Do you feel like you know how you're going to talk to your kids potentially? I will never procreate. So you learned a lot from these books. Yeah, there you go. You came to a clear decision. <laughs> when two people love each other. <laughs> Birds have a lot of sex. They have something to say. In a lot of Latinx families, there's shame or even trauma around the topic, which only further discourages conversation. And if you grew up in a Catholic family like I did, your takeaway might have been that sex is solamente para making babies y nada más, and that premarital sex would result in your eternal damnation. Okay, kids, who's horny? When we talk about why sex is taboo in um, communities of color, specifically Latinx communities, is mainly because of religion. We have Latinx communities that are prominent Catholic and Protestant. Purity culture and abstinence is stressed in those religions. It has colonization roots. Spaniards bringing over to Latin America their ideals of patriarchy and religion and their interpretations of what sexuality means. We have um, the virgin board dichotomy, this idea that the woman had to be either a virgin to be respected, or if not, she is automatically a whore. There is no middle ground. You also have machismo, this idea that in order to be a man, um, you have to dominate someone else. Dirty South Sex Ed, it's a platform that focuses on sharing sexual health information to change the way that we talk about self-care and wellness in communities with marginalized folks and to promote pleasure because it is something that marginalized groups always leave last in our daily lives because we're just focused on surviving. But more and more, we're talking about sex positivity, a concept rooted in the idea that sex is normal and healthy, not something we should be embarrassed about, and definitely not something that'll land us in a fiery inferno. I think sex positivity is about being empowered. So knowing what options are out there for you and feeling like you can make the best decision for yourself. In order to be empowered, you have to be knowledgeable. And in order to be knowledgeable, you have to be curious. I think a sex positive person is accepting of other people's ways of life. And they realize that what is their jam may be somebody else's yuck. I am a millennial and so many of people in my generation had really bad sex for a long time before they decided there's something different that I can do. 
I think the younger generation is being brought into a world where they realize that there are choices for them and that they don't have to subscribe to the one size fits all method that really didn't work for most of us. So I truly believe there's so much we can learn from this generation who is growing up asking themselves really important questions about their identity, about their sexuality, about their preferences, about consent in ways that past generations just weren't encouraged to. So sex education is no longer this thing that's only 11 p.m. on certain channels that, or, you know, pay-per-view. And now we have the Peacock, the show like X-rated, which really goes there. Our relationship expert, Shan Boudram, is here to help. Communication isn't about what you say, it's what you want to achieve. I think what X-rated does so beautifully is that it makes sex education very relatable, extremely engaging, very sexy, and a little bit cringy. Still, sex positivity is a radical concept in Latinx culture that can mean different things for different people. And especially different generations. Oh, hey there. My name is Maury Ramil, and tonight we're talking about sex. Accompanied here with me is Ninoshka, Rebecca, Vanessa. Tus padres te hablaron de sexo? Muy poco se hablaba de eso. Never. Will they crack the door open and just show? No, no. Sex before marriage. Mira, hoy en día. Stone them. Eh, me parece eh, que es mejor para saber si las personas se entienden. Es un must. You gotta do it. Yes, you have to test drive. Not only to know sex, but you know to know how to practice sex. Are you willing to call my girlfriend and tell her that? Yes, of course. If they give you the D. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Y no te gusta. Deja de hablar con él. No. Sexting. Is that something uh, we do? You're into? I'll send him some pictures of myself. Qué importante es el sexo en una relación. Por lo menos el 60%. ¿Por qué ustedes siempre tienen dolor de cabeza? Y yo gracias a Dios no me duele. Nunca te duele. No. <laughs> dick pics. I'm not really into dick pics. Is any woman ever into dick pics? You could send one. I'm not gonna say, hey babe, don't send that to me again. You forward it to the group chat and then you all laugh at it. <laughs> yes. Now if you're gonna send me some pics of something, it'd yeah. either be a nice woman. How about a man that has to Oh, well then he needs to go to the gym. Yeah, I didn't like the way you looked at me when you said that. <laughs> Role playing in the bedroom. You order a meat lover's pizza. I show up, like, hey, did you order this? And you whisper, yes, come in. Would that be something that you'd be into? Eh, no, no. I practice monogamy and I think it's the best way to. You practice origami? I practice only one. One position. Partner, oh, one partner. One pair, Monogamy. So... I'm sorry. Toys. I love them. <laughs> really? <laughs> yes. Talking, uh. Handcuffs. Handcuffs? Anal beads. Pueticos. Man, si, podría ser poco. Yes. Vibrators. Yes. Floggle. I don't know what that is. You're here? Super sexy. I thank you. Absolutely. You think maybe there could be something here? <laughs> I think you are very young for me. And I think you're very perfect for me. Oh my goodness. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> and look, I assume most of us are glad we avoided a condom tutorial with our dad or a diaphragm demonstration with that one really woke tia. But there are other, less cringy ways to get educated. Whether it's learning about contraception or learning how to access proper health care, taking care of your sexual wellness is a fundamental part of life. Sexuality is wellness. Sexuality is health care. It's not a separate part of that. I work all the time with the American Sexual Health Association, who has the latest information when it comes to protecting ourselves. And especially through the pandemic, when that question was more apparent than ever, they were the ones who had answers. People tell me like, well, you know, I already know all there is to know, or, well, I had sex education in high school, so I think I have enough. I'm like, let me tell you, there is so much more in store for you. And not just a matter of knowledge, there's more empowerment, there's better relationships, there's more joy. The Latinx community is the fastest growing group in the U.S but we're also the largest uninsured population. This coverage deficit combined with language barriers only compounds the already existing taboos around sexual health. 
So the types of attacks we're seeing across the country include attacks led by politicians against sexual and reproductive health care for all people. Planned Parenthood Federation of America is responding to attacks against sexual and reproductive health care through providing health services no matter what. It doesn't matter your race, your ethnicity, your immigration status, whether you can afford to pay or if you even have health care coverage, Planned Parenthood's doors are always open. One in five Latinos don't have any health care coverage at all. This is directly tied towards barriers including language access, economic mobility, or the COVID-19 pandemic that are leaving community members out of employment, which is directly tied towards a person's ability to access health care coverage. What makes sexual and reproductive health care services, as well as all health services, more attainable? Historically, education about HIV and AIDS has been widely stigmatized, which is why it's awesome to see Miss Universe and former Miss Mexico, Andrea Mesa, use her platform to spread awareness. Talking about sex in my country, or at least in the city and the family that I grew up in, uh, it was hard to talk about it. I, I felt that it was a taboo topic. When I grew up, it was hard. It was hard to ask my mom about certain topics. It was hard to ask my mom about my period. Even talking about that was uncomfortable. I believe it's it's positive for this young generations to have conversation about that. And most important with the family. Everyone has sex, but we just don't talk about it. We saw that you recently got a public HIV test. What kind of awareness do you hope that this will raise? This taboo that only uh, like the gay community should get tested because they're the ones that are more in danger. But the reality is that we all can have HIV and we all should get tested. So if you're having an a active sexual life, you have to get tested because you never know. Um, so I did it and I believe that through this action, I'm going to encourage this young generation to also do it and don't be afraid to do it. It's super simple. You just have to to go to a health institution, ask for your test, get tested. It's all confidential. They care about giving you all the health attention that you deserve as a human being. And the important thing is to get tested because the faster you know that you're HIV positive, the faster you're gonna take care of your health. The cultural silence around sex in Latinx communities only gets more complicated when you look at how it affects LGBTQ plus people. As a woman in her 30s in a heteronormative relationship who still never had an honest sex talk with her Mexican parents, I can only imagine how complicated things get when you're also grappling with a non-Roman Catholic sanctioned sexual identity, or when your parents' proximity to gay culture begins and ends with Walter Mercado. This episode is about the birds and the bees and how, as Latinos, it's really hard to talk about sex with your parents. How did your parents talk to you about sex? My parents have never talked to me about um, me as a person involved with sex, which is really interesting because I grew up in a house where like there was no baby names for like private parts. It was like, that's your d <laughs> these are your boobs. When I came out, the extent of my sex ed for my parents was don't wear a dress and don't get AIDS. They were, they're New Yorkers. Mm -hmm. So their like perception of queerness was like illness, and like heartache. When I came out to my parents, it was really weird because I was 12 or 13 mm. and my dad was like, so a penis goes into a vagina and I was like, what? Like I had, no, I like couldn't conceive of that physically. Yeah. And he, I was like giggling and I was like, no, no, no. And my mom was laughing. I was like, I'm having breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> and then I remember we went on a trip together and like my sister explained it better. Like, as a queer person, it's just harder because there are two straight people that have just like never talked about sex, much less queer sex yeah. in a way that's positive and not as a joke. Yeah. And that's what was really interesting about. Is your mom curious about like your partners or your dating life? No, it's hard for her because I think it's like opening up in that way is so, would require so much work. What about your parents? Uh, no questions. Actually, the only question she asked was, are you Jewish? <laughs> she was really excited about that. But otherwise, I, you know, I think she's uncomfortable. Is with he me. Jewish? No, <laughs> but my mom just sees like a big nosed white person and she's like, are you Jewish? Frankie, this has been really good. Thank you for being my trauma partner. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Can I disappear in a puff of smoke? Absolutely.
Where is Frankie? When we look at depictions of Latinxes in music, reggaeton is a genre where women have long been hypersexualized and objectified by the industry as a whole. But today, as female reggaeton artists like Evie Queen and others rise in popularity, they're also challenging outdated narratives. I'm Gata, I'm a reggaeton historian and the creator of Reggaeton Con La Gata. Her platform, Reggaeton Con La Gata, analyzes the past and present of reggaeton. According to Gata, sex and sexuality is at the essence of the music. By me uh, doing my research on the raíces of reggaeton, I've discovered that some of the pioneers actually had the direct intention of creating the beats per minute of the music, having it synonymous with the movements of sex. <laughs> to really understand reggaeton as a cultural force today, you have to dig into its roots. Reggaeton does not reflect its raíces in that it came from a very black place. You can trace it back all the way to its inicios with reggae and ska in Jamaica. And with bomba in Puerto Rico, hip hop, etc. It has always been a medium of resistance. And as a medium of resistance, part of that is sexual liberation. Despite being a force of sexual freedom, taboos around sex and gender surround the genre. Latinos, it's funny, we're branded as like these super sexy people, but when it comes down to talking about sex, everybody's like, ah, ah, ah. Men can talk about anything and everything, and the moment a woman does, uh, she's a mala mujer. Um, I hope to see that stereotype kind of diminished. I'm very excited to see in the future if women will go there. Um, if women will speak about, you know, their sexual escapades, how that will be received or not, whether it's lyrically or, you know, literally conversationally amongst female artists. Another industry where people are reclaiming their power is in sex work. Sites like OnlyFans, known for its adult content creators, have become extremely popular, boasting over 120 million users in 2020 and billions in revenue. I started very young stripping Right when I turned 18, because I had a child at 16, I, I was struggling, I was, minimum wage was $4. You could not live off of it. And I didn't have a college education. I knew stripping, you could get cash daily. I got on OnlyFans in 2017 because I just looked, I was like, oh wow, let me sign up for this. And the pandemic hit and they really, like it became a very big thing. All of a sudden the money just exploded. Everybody was locked in home. I discovered and a lot of, you know, when I would talk to fans, you know, a lot of fear, they would be like, you know, they didn't know what the virus was, you know, but they crave human connection. We're humans, we have needs, sexual needs. They were gonna ban explicit content, um, the pornography on OnlyFans. Um, there was a very big backlash. Um, personally, I, I'm used to this because I've been in the adult entertainment business for so long, so I know how things constantly change. It's just, it is stressful for a lot of people because it's not just the creators, it's also assistants, it's people that also, and you know, photographers, uh, management companies that also profit. So it's a big, you know, it does affect a lot of people. A lot of content creators are moving on. They're not gonna put all their eggs in one basket. I personally think that's a great idea to do. Challenging cultural norms in our communities is complicated. And for things to evolve, we'll have to rely on the ambition and creativity of Latinx innovators. I went to a private, um, all girls Catholic high school. The abstinence only education there being taught by the nuns, it was on another level. Growing up Latina, it just was like, I just felt like I continued to get message after message that was not sex positive. I don't represent all Latino cultures, but I definitely feel that my experience of not talking about your menstrual cycle, not talking about vulva hygiene and all of these things that I feel like we're missing. I ended up working as a sexologist, doing a lot of coaching for couples and singles. And then I ultimately ended up starting Bloomy when I saw that there was actually a need to provide solutions for folks. It's essentially a shopping and learning experience for sexual wellness products. So we've now screened over 7,000 products and only about 2% are actually considered clean. There's a lot of reasons, but the industry is highly unregulated. Um, a lot of companies focus on more um, ingredients that are um, cost effective or provide a tingling on the skin and things that aren't necessarily healthy. So if you need like hygiene products, menstrual care products, sex products, toys, couples products, um, we have that and then we have a ton of education. It's really important to 
continue to elevate narratives from the Latino community. I want people in the Latino community to start to feel more comfortable and start to feel um, like they have accurate information. Inspired by these entrepreneurs, I thought I'd visit a local sex shop here in Miami and ask our resident experts a few more questions. We're here at Playthings in Miami and we have some special guests that are gonna show us around. My name is Clarabelle Fabrias. I'm the acting store manager for Playthings. Playthings began in 2004 with the idea of removing the stigmas from adult stores. There is nothing here that we haven't heard and there are no taboos in the store. So when people come in and they want something special for a special night or they just want to get their sexy on, then obviously we will direct them to our exclusive lingerie line and we also can cater to bondage or what they call a fetish line as well. So it all depends on what you're looking for and what you feel comfortable in. Dr. Sofia Herrera, thank you so much for being on Radar. Thank you to you, I'm so excited to be here. What do you think is the main reason sex is so taboo in Latinx culture? Lack of getting education. My generation, I think that talk about sex is just saying, watch out, don't get pregnant. Watch out, you're gonna get a STD. That's not talk about sex, that's talk about problems. What are your thoughts on self-pleasure? It should be a must wow. for everyone. The only way to have like good, good sex life is to learn how to have it self-pleasuring and of course like going to your doctor, asking about the stuff you don't know. What is a piece of advice you could give people when it comes to having those healthy conversations around sexuality? First, it's never late to start talking about sexuality. Uh, teach the proper words, that's the second advice. Use the language appropriate to your kids. Uh, you always teach the eyes, the nose, but this is the ears, and down there we aliens. You have to use <laughs> vulva, vagina, penis, teach them about function, about uh, menstruation, about nocturnal uh, emissions. Sexuality should come from family but I think that sexuality has to include values. We live in a society where sex is everywhere, but talking about it, especially in Latinx families, is considered shameful. By the time my dad gave me the sex talk, Madonna and TLC had already taught me everything I thought I needed to know. When we don't prioritize educating ourselves about sexual health, we become vulnerable to learning about it from unreliable sources. No shade to left eye. Sex positivity is still a rare concept in the Latinx community, but the more we continue to have honest conversations about it, the less worried we'll be about burning in hell. I'm Gabriela Fresquez for Radar 2021. Thanks for watching Radar 2021. Please like, subscribe, and comment down below and let us know what issues are important to you. Because let's be honest, there are a lot of issues to choose from. <laughs> so, so many.